Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast. This is our Group of Five deep dive. I'm your host, Mike Calabres. I'm joined by my Action Network colleague and Malik Willis, professional hater, soon to be professional hater. It was a collegiate amateur, you know, hate relationship there for a bit, but he's graduating up to the NFL draft and now you can take your talents to the pro level. And that's really what this entire episode is about. We're going to get into what we would affectionately refer to as graduation day for a lot of the you know group of five studs that we followed all throughout the fall that we'll hear the name called at the NFL draft uh, next week. So really excited to get into it. And I would be remiss if we didn't start with one of our true favorites, a fan of the podcast. I know his mother is a fan of the podcast. Of course, we're speaking about Matt Ariza, the punt god. And my first question for you, Mike, is how high is too high to draft a punter of this caliber? I'll get into some of the stats. Um, there's actually um, a feature that was written on 538 um, in December that got into the exact you know, impact that he has on a football game. But I believe, I, I need to check my notes. I don't think a punter has been drafted you know, sooner than the third round in NFL history. So is there any chance that he sneaks into that third round? And if so, is that an overreaction or does the punt god have that much of a gravitational pull on an NFL roster. Yeah. So first of all, I just want to say how good it is to be back with you. I know we haven't done this in a couple of months. It's been, it's been a long, you know, three, three, four months without talking college football. And obviously we're going to do two episodes. First one's focusing on the studs. So what better to talk than our G5 stud, Matt Ariza. And to your point, it's, it's weird. I personally, I actually hate draft talk because it's, it's a lot of people who don't watch college football talking about college football. And it, it's, it's a combination of guessing what you think should happen and what you think will happen. So to answer your question, I do think Matt Arias should go very high in this draft. I think he's one of the more valuable players. He was one of the most valuable players in college football last year. I would take him in like the, you know, the third round ish. I, he probably doesn't go to the fourth or fifth just because that's the way NFL teams are. No one wants to take a punter in the fourth round. But I don't think I think it's an underreaction saying Matt Ariza should go in the fourth or third round. I think he's that valuable to teams. I think they sh he should go that high. What's interesting is that pro football focus, they went through and they tried to quantify how much value on a point basis that he had given to San Diego State last year. And he finished the year by average or by, you know, inputting into their whole system about 23 points worth of value which is kind of incredible when you think about it. Mean, it, 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 it does seem low, but it, it was a team that, you know, thrived on field position. It was a team that defense defensively was very good, but they needed him to pin teams and to flip the field as he did so many times. Um, what, what I think the only thing that could really tip it in terms of him being a third round pick, as opposed to a fourth or fifth round pick is NFL teams willingness. And it's so rare to play him at both punter kickoff specialist and place kicker. If a team actually wanted to do that, I think be, by virtue of saving one roster spot, he becomes an extra, you know, valuable asset to the franchise. But really, since Pat McAfee, it hasn't, you know, gone over in the NFL. Most teams want specialists. There's a reason that they're specialists. And in terms of his place kicking, he was good, but not great. Super That's elite honor. He's, he's not an elite place kicker, which I, which I think does. To your point, I, I do think. If he could do both at an elite level, he would be, but he's not, he wasn't that good of a kicker. I mean, according to pro football focus, he added the most points um, other than Texas's Michael Dixon, 2017. I think actually by season's end, he eclipsed the, the impact that Dixon had in 2017, but in the history of all their, their quantifying the punting data, he was number one. So I think even just on that alone, there's going to be some sweaty palms in those war rooms where it's like, if we pass on him in the third round, is he going to be there in the fourth round? particularly teams that either want to fortify themselves to have a good defense and they want to play field position, or if they have a bad defense and they want to at least put themselves in a position to force teams to have to go the length of the field. Um, I'm, that's like one of the storylines, you know, on day two and day three that I'm most interested in. And I would be just thrilled for him if he ends up on a good team. But what's interesting is usually you have these kids that you have this connection to, and you're like, I don't want to see this star quarterback go to a, a tire fire of a team, and just get beat up. But with a punter, it's like if their offense stinks, he gets a chance to star. It's it's not exactly like, you know, getting drafted by a bad team is going to hurt him all that much. So I think it's going to be all positive vibes and good feels for him on draft night. The Lions should take him number two overall. <laughs> Speaking of the Lions number two overall, 
Do you think that's uh, justified or maybe too high for a little guy I mentioned at the top, Malik Willis? Um, I will tee this up. I know that you have a ton to say about Liberty's greatest football player of all time. Thor Nystrom of NBC Sports actually made a, a stretch comparison to Michael Vick for Malik Willis. <laughs> Um, so, so I'm only going to, you know, rile you up with a, a few more lines here. Um, in terms of pro football focus, the thing that they loved about him was he made a lot of big time throws as, as they quantify it, which essentially means you're tacking downfield, you're putting the ball in tight windows and you're hitting a, a higher percentage than, than really should be expected. So he's a big play guy. And when you look at him against the blitz, 16 touchdowns to two interceptions, but as we know, and I know you'll get into it, he does have a tendency to hold on to the ball, try to make the highlight reel plays at you know all turns. And the one thing that caught my eye, and after this, I'll get out of your way, 197 carries last year. That's that's a lot even for a running back. You know, to be able to take that kind of pounding that he did and stay on the field, you could look at it as that's a positive, or you could look at it as you know how many hits is he going to take someone who's already missed time in his career due to injuries. All right, I will pass the baton to you, Malik Willis, as a bona fide top 10 pick, the number one quarterback off the board. What are your thoughts on that? <sighs> this is another reason I hate the NFL draft, because you have months and months of just overhyping these dudes based on what they do in shorts with no defense. And, and on the other side, I... I hate that then other people like me and, and, you know, there has to be that devil's advocate. There has to be the, like, you know, I'm going to be the Malik Willis hater. Malik Willis is an awesome football player. I loved watching him in college. He was very fun to watch. He is exciting. I like Malik Willis as a human. I think he's a very, very good football player. Calling him Mike Vick and, you know, Lamar Jackson is like the most insulting thing ever to those two quarterbacks. Malik Willis was like you said, he was the best Liberty player of all time. You want to know why? Because he couldn't beat out Bo Nix at Auburn. By the way, Malik Willis was a, uh, going into his junior year. Bo Nix was an incoming freshman, and Malik Willis couldn't beat his job, take his job. Now he's a first round draft pick. Yes, we talked about the scramble. He's electric, and he has a rocket arm. He looked great in shorts because he doesn't have to read a defense. That's what he can't do. He can't read a defense. He is elite at finding an open man and throwing a bullet into coverage or deep down the sideline and using his arm strength against little sisters of the poor. He is very good at that. I will give him that. He has, he has so many big time throws, but he was 99th in the country in adjusted completion percentage this year and 99th in turnover worthy play rate. His PFF, as you mentioned there, his passer grade was a 77.4. That is worse than guys like Chase Bryce Zach Calzada, Spencer Sanders, Jordan Travis, our boy Chris Reynolds from Charlotte, all of them had a better passer grade than Malik Willis. He threw 12 interceptions this year. Only three quarterbacks in the entire country had more. He threw multiple picks, three interceptions against Middle Tennessee State, UL Monroe, Ole Miss. Now you want him to play the Rams and the 49ers? He couldn't, he was horrible against Middle Tennessee. He completed just 61.4% of his passes this year. And I know a lot of people point to, you know, Josh Allen is, is, a, is a comp that people have, you know, rock and arm, inaccurate. For me, when you watch Willis, it's not so much he's inaccurate. Because I don't think he is that inaccurate, to be honest with you. If you watch him, he just makes bad decisions. It's not like, oh, I wanted to throw it here and it ended up over there. It's, I wanted to throw it here, but it's like, but you shouldn't have. If his first option's not open, he either does two things. He panics and throws an interception or more likely he panics, pulls the ball down and gets sacked. You mentioned, you sent the stat to me, so I'm going to snipe it. He averaged 3.33 seconds average throw time this year. That was 150th in the country. And, and all these, it, there's all this talk about his escapability in the pocket because he's fast and he's mobile. He had the third highest pressure rate turned into sacks in the entire country. So it's not just like, oh, he, you know, he scrambles and, and, and gets away. No, he gets sacked. He doesn't get away. He gets sacked. He got sacked 50 times last season. That was the most in the country by a wide margin. The next closest only had 44. So for all his mobility and escapability, he still gets sacked more than anyone in the country. So 
I just don't like the fact that he can't read a defense. It's yeah. He has the rocket arm. And if his first option's wide open, all right, sure. He can bomb it 70 yards down the field, hit him in stride and score a touchdown. That's great. But if that guy's not op- open, it's either a sack or a turnover. And that is not first round pick material. It's just not, he's, he is a long, long project. And the, the teams in the first 20 are usually teams that stink that don't have weapons who can get open. That's the issue. I I think the Malik Willis hype is outrageous. And to tee back to you, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that like I I think are legitimate questions to ask. Would you rather have – is Malik Willis better than Jalen Hurts? Would you rather have Willis or Hurts? Would you rather have another mm. – a more comp than Lamar Jackson is – would you rather have – who's better, Malik Willis or Malik Cunningham? I'm a Packers yeah. fan. Would you rather have Malik Willis or Jordan Love? Because Jordan Love had the same type of talk coming out. Like, Jordan Love was projected to be a first-round pick. Jordan Love has a cannon arm. Jordan Love was mobile. Would you rather have Willis or Jordan Love? I I think what you're getting at, it also boils down to draft capital. So getting Jalen Hurts in the second rounds, as opposed to Jordan Love in the first rounds, like, I I just, I think it, it comes down to what you're giving up to get them. You know, the Rams right now, if you take, a bet for them to take Willis second overall that pays seven to one. That's probably how I'm going to roll the dice on this one, just because I think the lions are desperate in the NFL. You can talk about culture building and winning with defense and yada, yada, yada. If you don't have a quarterback, that is a difference maker. It's very difficult to have a winning record in the NFL. So I think even in a draft that is lean on difference making quarterbacks, I think there's a, a better than, good shot that the lions stretch and go for him at two. So in terms of how I'm playing this, I'm going to go with that bet. But in general, I agree with you where it's like, if he was viewed more as a project, because you also have to back out and look at like, what is Hugh freeze's track record in terms of producing NFL ready quarterbacks? Like it's never happened. So he, he creates offensive systems that give their, op- give their offense a chance to hit big plays their quarterbacks a chance I, I think about um swag kelly taking shots down the field and extending plays with his legs like very similar swag kelly obviously was not quite the athlete that malik is but he had no nfl future right, right from the get-go where it's like coming in showing how to you know beat an nfl defense he couldn't do it and i think there's a lot of the warning signs here with willis as well you know he doubles his interceptions year over year total from last season into this season and then on top of it there's the numbers that I quoted against the blitz, 16 touchdowns to two picks, that's great. But what he would do is he would hold the ball and create pressure around him. And then at that point, his NFL passer rating was 59. An NFL passer rating of 59, you know, you end up getting cut. Like you, you don't even have a future as a backup. So I agree with you. I think this is, you know, kind of the, the natural reaction of the NFL draft you know, industrial complex where it's like, there has to be a top five quarterback every year. There has to, there has to be multiple really where they're trying to talk themselves into Desmond Ritter. Someone I'll mention later as a bona fide, you know, top 15 pick option. It's like, it doesn't have to be that way. Like the rest of the draft process, you know, they, they really, I think they undervalue positions like safety. They overvalue positions like quarterback. There's just, it's difficult for everyone to get on the same page that it's okay for a particular class to be weak at the quarterback position, but I don't think that's how it's going to play out. I think there's going to be, you know, some reaches and uh, Willis is going to be one of them. To your point about, you know, the, the Lions possibly, and obviously this is, this is, you know, at its nature, a betting podcast. So for some action, uh, if Malik Willis does go in that first 15 picks and it looks, you know, very clearly like he's in a spot where he's expected to, if not start right away, start soon, you know, Jared Goff situation, you don't know who's their starter there. Uh, I will bet whoever drafts Malik Willis, I'll bet their season win total under next season, probably Friday morning, if I think he's going to be their starter, because he's just, he is not ready to be an NFL quarterback. Speaking of quarterbacks that are not ready, I will jump over to Desmond Ritter, a guy that I really liked. I'm thrilled that he was able to play well enough in their big games. You know, when you look back two years ago against Georgia, They get that momentum, that credibility in the offseason. They build on it by going into Notre Dame. He played another good game there. He plays well against Houston, the AAC title game. And obviously, not just him, but the whole offense, like, shut down. And and I really blame more so the coaching staff from Cincinnati in that playoff game against Alabama. You got to play with a certain amount of house money. You got to take some shots downfield, some trick plays, if you're going to beat a Nick Saban coach team. And they were so conservative in that game. I think it really put them behind the eight ball from the get-go. All that being said... I think 
the reasons why NFL teams look at him in terms of being potentially a quality starter is that for starters, he doesn't turn the ball over, which I think is a really key indicator. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you had a guy like Sam Darnold, who had all kinds of issues in his last year as a starter in LA with interceptions and fumbles. And that to me is a red flag. James Winston had that same issue the season after his Heisman campaign. And some teams, they just blow right through that, that red light. But with Ritter, he's done a good job, 14 picks in two years as a starter. And he's someone who had the ball in his hands a lot. He was, you know, involved in the running game with the read option. He, you know, threw a lot of passes, you know, particularly downfield when he was going for Alex Pierce. So it wasn't just dink and dunk all the time. And clearly he's a plus runner, nearly a thousand yards across the last two years, 18 TDs. As I mentioned, his game film against some of the better teams, defensively, Georgia, Notre Dame, Houston, all of that's great. I just don't see it as a first round pick, but I do believe that he has a chance to come off the board here. I'm going to sweat it out in the last 10 picks because I think it's going to be Pickett ahead of him. And that's going to be a question. Are the Steelers putting up a smoke screen? Do they really want to take him at 20? Do they move back? I think it's a smoke screen um, for a team that's, you know, historically been pretty conservative with quarterback draft picks. I'm going to go ahead and make a recommendation. If you can get under two and a half quarterbacks in the first rounds at plus 200 or better, that's my threshold to pull the trigger. So I'm going to shop around for that right now. It's in that plus 190 plus 205 range. So I'm going to see if it can bubble up just a little bit higher and then I'll go ahead and take it. Cause I do think there's enough question marks around him in particular to see only two quarterbacks go off the board in the first round. What do you think about that play in terms of both Ritter and also quarterbacks in, in round one? Um, I think Corral would make me nervous. I think Corral sneaks into that, that end of the first round potentially. Um, but as far as, as Ritter goes, to me, he's almost the exact opposite of Malik Willis, where he, I almost think he is the most NFL ready. Cause as you mentioned, he's got 50 games of college experience. He was 44 and six as a start, the third most wins in FBS history, 30 touchdowns, just eight picks, six rushing touchdowns. You know, all you hear about this guy is great leader, great worth work ethic, led Cincinnati to the playoffs. And, and he's to me the opposite of Willis where he has, you kind of know what his ceiling is, but he's got a very high floor. Like, I think he's a guy, you know, this, like the Steelers, like he would be perfect for the Steelers. Go out there, you know, just hand the ball to Naj, dink and dunk, don't turn the ball over and let our defense and running game win us the game. Um, he, he gets the ball out really quickly. He makes the right decision. He, he doesn't have the best throwing mechanics. He doesn't have the strongest arm, but he doesn't turn the ball over. He's a good leader. He knows how to run an offense. I think he is the the safest like going into next season um, just because of his experience. Uh, to me, he reminds me a ton of Teddy Bridgewater where you know what you're going to get. He's never going to, you know, win you the Super Bowl and be the most flashy and sell the most jerseys. But you're like, we could put Teddy in and we're going to go 500. And, and yeah, Tyrod Taylor, he's one of those guys to me um, who are both serviceable NFL starters. So to me, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know that he goes in the first round unless the Steelers take a stab at him. Um, but going back to the Malik Willis point, I'd much rather draft Desmond Ritter in the second round than draft Malik Willis in like the top 15 picks. The backup uh, for a teammate that I think is going to go off the board before Ritter, certainly before Ritter, Sauce Gardner. Love this guy as someone who bet Cincinnati a lot across the last two years. He was someone that made me so confident in those picks. The defense as a whole, you know, under Freeman was tremendous, but he really made it all work because he had that rare combo of being, you know, pro football focus quantifies this, a top 10 cover corner in all college football, but also from the cornerback position, a top 10 run defender. And I think that's becoming more and more important in the current NFL because you have, you know, more of those sub packages on the field as your base defense, you have fewer linebackers on the, on the field. So you need corners and safeties who can really tackle. He can do that. He's 98th uh, percentile on arm length and height for his position. And because of that, I think he's an ironclad lock to be the number one corner that comes off the board. Caesar Sportsbook has it at minus 400. I'm going to use it as a free multiplier. I'm tacking that on to almost every other bet I make in the first round to you know flip the juice from minus 110 to plus 120 in that range for me. I also like him to go off the board before the eighth pick. You can get that at minus 150. Um, I think there's a lot of teams are really going to be interested in his services. I wouldn't be shocked to see him go fourth or fifth overall, depending on how the musical chairs work with some potential trades. Um, but sauce is a guy I really love. And I have a lot of fond memories of him. You know, this 
entire podcast is about studs. I want to make sure to give the love to the defensive side of the ball and mainly to Sauce Gardner. What, what are your thoughts on him potentially being a top 10 pick? I love it. I love Sauce Gardner. I had, I had a little trouble finding, you know, actionable bets I liked. It's not available in Pennsylvania. It's a little tricky to find. The one I had written down, which I absolutely love, is Sauce Gardner under seven and a half draft position. Um, I think, he, like you said, I think he's top five pick. I think, obviously, not including Matt Ariza, I think he's the best group of five player in this draft. He is the best corner in this draft. There, there's not a lot of holes you can poke in his game when you when you watch it. You know, 6'3", big, ran a 4'4", four, four, fast, like you mentioned, freaky long arms. Ne- we've all heard the stat. He's never allowed a touchdown pass his entire college career, over 1,100 snaps. He is dominant. But make, what I love about him the most, too, is he his style, like, he is so good at press coverage. He plays more press coverage than any corner in the country. He gets up in your face, smacks you in the mouth, gets you off your route immediately. And, and for someone who plays so physical and so press, the most impressive thing about him, especially this year, was he really, really cut down on the penalties. That was, like, his only red flag uh, two years ago. He only got called for two penalties all of last season. So for a guy who pl- plays such press coverage and is in your face making contact, to only get called for two penalties is so incredibly impressive to me. And the thing I love about him the most is he is so confident. He talks so much shit and he backs it up. And that's what you want out of a corner. You know, you want a corner that's in the receiver's head, talking to him, jamming him at the line, saying they're going to shut him down, and then doing it. Cannot be more of a Sauce Gardner fan. Under seven and a half draft position. I love it. I think the Giants probably take him. The Jets might take him. He's going in that top that top eight, like you said. I love Sauce Gardner. I can't quite see because your camera's cropped a little bit, but you do have a Mac shirt on, correct? You know, this is this is a, a Mac friendly podcast. And plenty of, of plenty of love. Plenty of love for the AC, plenty of love for the, the Mountain West with Ariza. But let's go to the Mac. Let's talk Sky Moore. This is a guy who you know, probably 15 to 20 years ago would have been a sixth or seventh round pick because he's only 5'10", about a buck 90. But in the modern NFL, for someone who ran a 4'4", 40-yard dash, had a solid vertical, elite route runner, you know, could run the full tree. Um, really, I think when you look at his highlight reel, what jumped off to me was it wasn't a lot of bubble screens and slants that he was taking to the house. He had great body control when he went up and he had some huge games this year and particularly early in the season against Pitt, he sparked that upset. 11 receptions, 124 yards, a TD. He's someone that I love, and I'm going to give uh, a piece of advice in terms of how to bet this. Unfortunately for him, this draft class is crazy deep at wide receiver. You're going to see so many names go off the board in the first round that are not Sky Moore, and he really has no chance of jumping over them. However, once you get to that second round and you can get some live numbers on when he'll go – I think there's a chance that he could go before Dotson and before George Pickens, just because of some of the, the fit, the fits of the teams that are looking to add him, the lions, Browns and Colts all in that like first 10 picks of the second rounds window. They all have needs at wide receiver. And I think just given how well he played and the fact that he was the number one option and he still put up, I think he had 95 receptions last year, some incredible numbers, someone that was an absolute pleasure to watch. One of the best upsets of the entire year from G5 lands, beating a pit team that ends up going to a New Year's Six Bowl. So lots of love for Sky Moore. I'm going to go ahead and if I can get a live number coming off the board, um, that's, you know, plus for him to leapfrog either Dotson, Pickens or both. You know, if you can get that, you know, next wide receiver to go off the board at two to one, three to one, four to one, somewhere like that in round two, I'm going to go ahead and take a shot. I think he's an undervalued asset. I think he performed really well at the, you know, the pre-draft combine and events and things like that, and interviews, everything that seems to be coming out around him, whether from NFL.com, some of the, the analysts, some of the recruit Knicks who have access to general managers, seems to be some solid buzz on him. So just a name I have circled, and I know you're a big Western Michigan fan, a team that you've played a lot in the last couple of years. What are your thoughts on Sky Moore? Yeah, I love Sky Moore. Like, like you mentioned, that that big upset against Pitt, which uh, I, I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, we gave out their money line on the podcast. The show. Shout out to us. Um, yeah, obviously, the, you know, the 5'10 is a concern people will point to. But I agree with you. He he forced 30 missed tackles last season, the second most in the country. The, wor- the word you'll constantly hear used to describe Sky Moore is shiftiness because he's not the fastest. Like, he doesn't have that, you know, 4'3 track speed. 
but he's just shifty. He is quick. He has, like you said, great body control. He's great in and out of cuts, great at breaking tackles. The, a huge thing I loved seeing from Sky Moore, usually I don't put much stock into anything that comes out of the combine, like, you know, Kenny Pickett's mm-hmm. hand size, who cares? But Sky Moore had the biggest hands of any receiver at the combine, which is a good sign. Like, I like that for someone who is small. Like you said, he can, he can go up and play above his size because his hands are so big. He's able to make catches. He had the second best receiving grade in the entire country. Um, he'll probably be used as a slot receiver in the NFL. Um, but I love, love Sky Moore. I think we see a decent amount of G5 receivers uh, on that second day. Because another guy I want to mention is Jalen Tolbert, um, who is – to me, he, he's like DK Metcalf. Yeah, he's, big. he's the opposite of Sky Moore. He is yoked. He is absolutely shredded. He, he, he looks like DK Metcalf, to be honest with you. He is big. He is fast. He is a great deep threat. Another guy has great body control. He is really good at going up and getting the ball. Really good at high pointing it. Uh, he was third in the country last year with 122.8 yards per game. He had a 14.2 average depth of target. Led the country with 18 receptions of 30 plus yards. So this guy is just send him on a fly route, go up and get it. And I love, especially with these G5 guys, you mentioned Sky Moore against Pitt. It's always important to see what they did against the higher competition, against that that power five level. Well, when South Alabama played Tennessee, granted, you know, Tennessee's not the best defense, but it's an SEC defense. Jalen Tolbert, seven catches, 143 yards, and a touchdown. He absolutely dominated the volunteers. So Jalen Tolbert's another guy I'm, I'm loving. I like Sky Moore, Christian Watson, not really G5, but FCS, Christian, Christian Watson. He's one of the guys where I knew absolutely nothing about until the combine, and apparently he, like, tested off the charts, and people are loving uh, him. Our boy Calvin Austin will probably go in that, you know, third-ish, fourth-ish round. Uh, he's kind of like Sky Moore, just not as not as good, I would say. Um, but, yeah, I definitely love, love Moore and Tolbert. I think they both go in the second round. I think they're both they're both studs. As someone who lives in the college fantasy football world, Tolbert's been on my radar for a long time, really held back by some shoddy quarterback play over the years, you know, at South Alabama. But when you look at the way that he's able to break games wide open, he opened the season on a seven game stretch where he had at least one 40 plus yard catch. That's ridiculous. Like when you, when you look at his game log, like some of these stats are these pop off the screen, including Tennessee he had a 68 yard touchdown in that game. So I agree with you. I think he's someone that has all the physicality and someone who could be a a good example of someone who progresses and matures at the NFL level and is even better than the college version because he's finally getting professional quarterback play as opposed to not only did they have some identity issues offensively and kind of swishing between, um, you know, run pass ratios, but also just playing musical chairs at quarterback. So I, I really like Tolbert a lot. I think he will come off the board in the second round. All right, one more that uh, I'm going to tease up here. Our next podcast is going to be about sleepers. This was about some of the studs that we really liked. A super deep sleeper, because as the folks watching on YouTube can see above my head, I have the Western Kentucky helmet. We're not going to talk about the Zap God, but we are going to talk about his number one target who finished last season with 150 receptions. Like, are you kidding me? Jareth Stearns, he's a kid that's, I find to be really interesting because he torpedoed his own college career with his 40 yard dash in high school. He ran a four, eight, six 40 in high school. So he ends up at Houston Baptist. We've covered this many times. He ends up, you know, absolutely tearing up the record books down there, goes to Western Kentucky. You know, they, they accomplish things that have never been seen at the FBS level. And now he comes in, and where is he going to be drafted? Fifth, sixth, seventh round. Some grades have him as an undrafted free agent. I think that's ridiculous. He reminds me a lot of James Proch, the SMU wide receiver is with the Ravens, who in year two had a little bit of success. I think he had 20, 25 receptions for the Ravens last year. I think that's the kind of player you're getting. And it's an opportunity for me to say, say his hometown, which is Waxahachie, Texas. That's a fantastic town name. So we're going to get in some more sleepers. Is there anyone you're really excited in the next pod to talk about from the sleeper perspective? Because G5 is never at a shortage of those players. Yeah, there's so many wide receivers. I'll probably save the wide receiver talk um, for the next pod. Um, a couple of guys, I wasn't sure where we were draw, drawing the line between studs and sleepers. So I kind of just did an outline for this pod, guys I thought would go in the, you know, the top three-ish round. So I'll just really quick, a couple of other guys, and we can touch on more next pod. Um, you know, Carson Strong is someone I'm super interested in. Um, I know we both love Carson Strong. He's another one, rocket arm, 
makes all the throws, crazy arm talent, obviously the knee issues. Um, he's had a ton of knee injuries um, is, is kind of his big concern. Um, I think this is kind of a weak running back class for G5 guys. You know, Tyler uh, Algier is probably the top G5 guy um, from BYU. He's interesting. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Algier, but he isn't, he's not the fastest guy, which I think is going to hurt him. Um, obviously, ton of wide receiver. Oh, another stud I wanted to talk about that I do think goes in the first two rounds is Trey McBride from Colorado State. Absolutely. He's another one where he he, he may be – I, I might be forgetting someone. He might be the top tight end off the board, right? Who, who else – who are the top tight end prospects? I know definitely the top G5 guy, but he might be the top overall tight end, unless I'm totally blanking on somebody else. Um, 90 catches, 1,100 yards. He had the highest receiving grade in the country last season among any player at any position, wide receiver, tight end, running back. And Colorado State was, like, so bad, and he was their only weapon. He was their entire offense. Everyone knew he was getting the ball, still managed 90 catches, He's a deep threat option who just blows past linebackers. And the big thing about him is he's one of those tight ends, the George Kittle, that loves blocking. He loves blocking. He loves throwing dudes out the club. And then he's just a, an awesome receiver. So I, I'm really high on Trey McBride. This is actually a sneaky good draft for tight ends. You'll have Isaiah Likely go probably, you know, fourth-ish round. Cole Turner will probably be a late late tight end as well. Um, so Trey McBride's definitely a guy I want to talk about. Um, a couple other defenders, you know, Chad, Chad Moom is probably the, the first G5 linebacker. You got Cam, Cam Thomas, the edge rusher from San Diego State. He probably probably sneaks in the second round. Shout out UConn. There's been a lot of talk of Travis Jones, the big D tackle from UConn, that he could sneak into the first round. When's the last time a UConn player was drafted in the first round? Was it Byron Jones, probably? Uh, so Travis Jones, you know, shout out to the Huskies. It's, it's mind-boggling, but he's 6'5", 333 pounds. He's just an absolute you know, man, they just put in the middle of the field and let him clog up everything. Um, so, yeah, those are just a couple more games I want to throw out. I'm sure your UConn, you know, interior defender had a little bit of that Bobby Boucher energy where they call a timeout and be like, all right, defense, you know, let's run to the football. We can do it together. And then they bring him aside. It's like, you're the only one who can do anything. These right. guys are awful. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing that you could have an NFL player on just one of the worst defenses we've seen really the last 15 years in college football. Um, but that's what makes this time of year fun. I think everyone deserves their shine and we'll certainly get into it more in the next pod. Some of those deep sleepers. Um, so it's, it's just good to talk college football again. You know, there's, this is really the, the time of year when people are putting together their data sets, when the transfer portal is starting to cool off a little bit, there's more stability with the rosters. You're starting to see, you know, some separation from spring ball in terms of how the depth charts are going to shake out at quarterback. So lots of interesting things happening in college football. And before you know it, you know, media days will be cranking. I think we should get a media pass. I mean, does, does the Mac have a, a live event? I, I hope it's not on zoom only, but I would love to go to the Sun Belt, the Mac media days, wherever they're at, you know, what? I'll go Sun Belt because the chances of it being in like Dayton, Ohio, for the Mac or, probably too high for my say, liking. You, you, say, you, say, you said where are they at? Like they're not 100% in either Dayton, Ohio or Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't mind going down to Myrtle Beach or something like that uh, and talking Grayson McCall and yeah. everything else that's happening in, in G5 land, particularly in the Sun Belt. So we'll put a pin in that. Will, for our boy Will Healy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Club Lit is, is asking for us. Um, so hopefully we can get on the road a little bit and provide some extra analysis from a new exotic locale. Um, but if we don't, you can still count on us throughout the off season to bring a bit more of the G5 deep dive to get you revved up for college football. We'll really start in earnest the end of July and early August, getting into some of those season previews. Um, but we will have one more episode here for NFL draft talk coming next week ahead of the NFL draft. We'll get into sleepers. So you can get it, go ahead and check us out anywhere that fine podcasts are sold. This has been the big bets on campus podcast. I'm Mike Calabrese. He's Mike Ionello. Thank you so much for listening.